in the words of the great Michael Jordan, I'm back. Or I should say we're back. Quick Slants is back here on the OU Insider YouTube channel. Parker Thune alongside Jesse Crittenden. And with the spring game just five days away, it seemed as opportune a time as ever to bring back the Quick Slants series, which, of course, is a mainstay throughout the fall as the Sooners navigate what historically has been a Big 12 schedule and what obviously this fall will be an SEC schedule. But special edition of Quick Slants here on this Monday. Mr. Crittenden and I have been talking quite a bit off the air and a lot of interesting angles that we would like to hit over the course of this report, if you will. And let's start with some of the things that we witnessed slash experienced at Friday's open practice session, Jesse. And it was my first time because I hadn't been at the two extended open availabilities on Easter week, uh, I was already preoccupied with Easter plans. So had gotten to go to the other abbreviated media session uh, last week, but this was the first time I really got to see Zach Alley working with the linebackers, Jesse. And first thing that you notice right off the bat is everybody calls him a mini Brent Venables for good reason, because he walks and talks and coaches exactly like his mentor, Oklahoma's head coach. Chip off the old block. Well, Brent and Brent went as far as he basically said everything except calling him a mini version of himself. But everything, I mean, he said he's he look he thinks a lot like me. They do things a lot the same way. And I actually think Zach Alley, in this being his first spring as a defensive coordinator, was not talked about enough as what that would actually look like. And yeah, Parker, I think the first thing you notice is is he just has more of a control of that defense. And I think it was really interesting to see him work with the linebackers during individual drills. Cause I think a lot of the times the last couple of years and no shade at Ted roof, but it was really Brent Venables and James Skalski running those linebacker drills and Ted roof's a part of them, but it didn't really ever feel like he was running them. Zach mm -hmm. Alley's running those linebacker drills. And I think he's not only had a bigger hand in the defense as a whole, but you've seen Venables move around a little bit more. You've seen him move around a little bit more to other position groups. And the players have even talked about that too. I think Zach just has a bigger hold of this defense. And that's really what you want. You want somebody that not only is an extension of Brent to run things, but you want Brent to have a little bit more of a hand in everything else. And I think as to what we've seen so far, we've seen that. I legitimately had to do a double take on Friday because I overheard Venables coaching up the linebackers, you know, shouting at him, run, run them through everything. And then I look over there and I realize, Oh, he's in a bright blue shirt. He's not usually wearing that. And I was like, Oh, Oh wait, that's not Brent Venables. That's Zach Alley. They sound identical, especially once they get coaching the tone of their voices even sounds exactly the same. So I think what's really exciting is that Brent Venables is 53 years old. He is by no means a geezer, but he is also no spring chicken. And so as you have Venables navigating, however long of a tenure he will have as head coach at the University of Oklahoma, you're going to have a younger version of him, a nearly 25 years younger version of him uh, coming up and hopefully enjoying the prime of his coaching career at the University of Oklahoma, which ought to be a fun dynamic. This was Sammy Omasigo on Friday, the rising sophomore linebacker on Zach Alley and what he has brought to this staff. Uh, coach Ali is an amazing coach, man. He's very profound. You know what he's doing. Very experienced. Even though he's a relatively young coach, he knows Zach. He knows a lot about football. You know what he's doing, and he's a great fit to the Oklahoma Center staff. Pretty clear, Jesse, that even though Zach Alley has never been a coordinator at the Power Four level before, everybody who has interacted with him, conversed with him, experienced him since he got to Oklahoma realizes he is more than qualified to be the co-defensive coordinator at OU. Yeah, and I think I mean, really, a lot of the players have even said he's done a he's done a really good job of helping simplify things. And I also think there's just been more there in terms of Zach building a relationship with these players off the field, too. You've heard a couple of them talk about how they, you know, Zach Alley kind of behind the scenes is a little bit of a jokester. He he really likes to, you know, get along with players that way. He's kind of a funny guy. A couple of players have referred to him as. So I think just overall, it's just I think 
you're seeing Zach Alley really be not only more of an extension of Brent, but I think there's just more of a connectedness and a more cohesiveness. And I think there's more of a confidence from the players into what Zach Alley is, is wanting to do. I think there's just, there's just more transparency. There's more connectedness. And I think, I think there is belief in what Zach Alley can do. And he's, he is a younger guy. I think the players relate to that more. And, and I think overall it's the spring, the vibes are always high, but I think the early returns on Zach have been pretty positive. And the expectation for that Oklahoma defense, or I should say expectations are very, very high heading into the fall as they bring back nine of 11 starters from that unit a year ago. They make such key additions as Des Malone, the San Diego State transfer at cornerback. And of course, David Stone and Jaden Jackson, the two outstanding freshman defensive tackles transitioning to the offensive side of the ball. There have been a couple of gripes from the fan base and certainly a couple of disses from opposing fan bases for the Sooners this spring. One of them has been, well, the best tight end is that kid from southeastern Louisiana. How good can he possibly be? Uh, Bauer Sharp's going to be good. And that is more than the consensus when you talk to anybody that has been privy to practice sessions in Norman. I'll tell you this much. I, like I've had multiple sources, qualified ones at that, within that building tell me Bauer Sharp is an NFL tight end. He is that good. Now, he comes to Oklahoma with two years of eligibility. So this year uh, will be an opportunity for him to really work into his role uh, within the Oklahoma offense and Seth Luttrell's offense at that tight end spot. And then he'll get a chance to run it back if he so desires in 2025. But here was Bauer Sharp on Friday talking about uh, the role that has been thrust upon him at Oklahoma. I love it. Joe John has told me from the get-go, I'm going to get an opportunity. And just when that opportunity comes, I'm trying to make the most of it. But every guy, every guy, every guy's just a leader. There's no, there's no some leaders and not leaders. Every guy's a leader starting with 11. You know, he, he's, he's stepping in that role more and more each, each and every day. And so I try to be that, try to be that guy as well, vocally, and try to lead these guys. So You watch Bauer Sharp move around out there, Jesse. And A, it's really, really tough to figure how he was ever at a place like southeastern Louisiana to begin with. And it's not at all difficult to figure why he had so many big time offers coming out of the transfer portal this January. Well, and you know, as well as anybody, man, when it comes to the recruiting process and, and how kids are noticed in high school and where they end up, there's just so many factors in that process. And in terms of how it all plays out and where a kid ends up, not to mention that the growth process for, for, players just isn't the same some people don't really hit their stride until after the high school recruiting process is over and I think for Bauer it's just and even put all that aside or where he came from that dude he just offers just more zip in this offense he's just his size is immediately immediately stands out his speed immediately stands out I think his mindset and how excited he is to be here has or in being Norman has just stood out and I think it's just it's just clear that he offers something that this tight end room hasn't really had in a while. And that's not to take away. I think there should be excitement about Josh Van Well and, and Devon Mitchell, too, and what they've shown in that tight end room as a whole. But for Bauer, I think you just have to give credit to Joe John Finley and the staff for noticing him just like other I mean, other big time programs did. And they managed to get him here. And it's him and Dion Burks have been the two new guys that have stood out more than anybody. It doesn't really matter where they came from. I think Bauer, there should be all kinds of confidence. He can come in and bring something that this offense really needs. And this winter, we all kind of talked about Devon Mitchell as the most likely freshman to make a start at some point on the offensive side of the ball. And that was kind of because it was a shot in the dark with Bauer Sharp to a certain extent. Sure, the athleticism showed up on tape, but you never necessarily know with a kid that's jumping from the FCS to FBS level if it's going to fully translate. And I guess we still don't know that for sure, Jesse, but all indications are that it's going to translate and it has translated. What do you think success looks like for Bauer Sharp in 2024? What can be reasonably expected of the number one tight end in Seth Luttrell's scheme? I, I think ultimately, I mean, a lot of people are going to point to what does that production potentially look like? But to me, it's not going to be, a, it's not a very high bar in terms of, trying to be a little bit more productive than even Austin Stogner was last year. Right. That's just, I think that's just a, that's a baseline expectation, but I think to me, it's just, can he be a threat in this offense? Can he be somebody that defenses really have to lock in on? Cause that's just a facet of the offense. Oh, you didn't have last year. So to me, I think it's, 
it's for Bauer. It's just being a, a versatile guy that defenses have to take into account. Can he become a safety blanket, not only over the middle for, for Jackson Arnold, but can he be a deep play threat? Can he be a legitimate contributor when it comes to run blocking? Uh, you know, I, so, I mean, all, I think I'm as high on him as anybody. And I think ultimately, I think if you're a fan, you just want to see is Bauer having a real tangible impact on the game in a variety of ways. And I think he could do that. Now I talked about a couple of gripes. That was one as well. The best tight ends from Southeastern Louisiana, right? The other gripe and to a certain extent, it's a valid one is, well, Oklahoma is not going to be that good up front. And certainly when you have to replace all five starters, you are quite literally starting from scratch, right? You have guys that have seen reps before at Oklahoma. You have a guy in Jacob Sexton uh, that has made several starts and does have that on his resume at Oklahoma. You bring in a couple experienced transfers and the likes of Fabechi Wee and Michael Tarquin and Garen Hatchett to kind of help stabilize things. And that's great, but still five brand new starters is five brand new starters. And it doesn't help matters, Jesse, when your presumed starting center, Troy Everett, goes down a week into spring practice with an injury that's going to keep him out until probably October. That's the prognosis, the most reasonable prognosis that we've gotten just talking to sources that would have some authoritative knowledge of the rehab process therein. Now, that has put a lot on the shoulders of redshirt freshman Josh Bates at center. Here was Bates on Friday talking about everything that he has had to inherit, if you will, in the wake of Everett's injury. You know, it's good. Um, you know, I accept the challenge. Uh, there's not, there's not one challenge that you know I'm, I'm going to be afraid of or anything. Um, it's it's gone smooth for me. Um, I got a bunch of people in my corner to help me out. You know, Coach B is going to coach me hard and get me ready and prepare me to um, play at the level I need to. And uh, Troy Everett, he's been nothing but a big brother to me. You know, I love that. I love him and. Um, everything he's done to help me prepare and um, be the best at this position and at Oklahoma. Um, I'm getting better. I got a lot of room to grow, um, a lot of experience to gain, but, um, you know, I, I accept the challenge and I'm, uh, I'm getting ready. So. Now, center is an important position on the offensive line, Jesse, a keystone one. And, for instance, you saw uh, the final year that Creed Humphrey was at Oklahoma in 2020 versus – Andrew Rame, who was then a redshirt freshman in 2021 and turned out to be a good player in his own right. But there was a very conspicuous difference in the quality of play and how Creed not only held down the center spot, but affected those around him. And there was something of a drop off that following year in 2021 when the Sooners were breaking in Andrew Rame as a first year starter. Now, one way or another, they're going to have a first year starter at center this year, whether that is somebody like Josh Bates, or whether that is Troy Everett when fully healthy again, maybe Josh A. Sosa, the true freshman, kind of inserts himself into the conversation, and who knows what could happen with the likes of a B.J. Brooks or even you know sliding one of those guards inside. Brent Venables has mentioned Garen Hatchett can play that position if needed. But uh, what do you think right now with the struggles that the Sooners have had with both the first and second team offensive line throughout the spring, how much of that could be remedied by having a guy really seize the bull by the horns at that center spot, whether that's Bates or somebody else? Yeah, I think ultimately, I mean, really when it comes to the offensive line, like both things can be true. And like, for me, I'm more optimistic about the group than I was coming into the spring. I think there's guys that have, have really stood out to me and you've you've named some of them, but still it's not it's not ideal. They they need there's still a ton of question marks heading into the summer and the fall. There just are. So I think when it comes to that center position, there's no doubt that Troy Everett's injury really hurts because now you're throwing Bates into the mix and you mentioned it. It, it not only does the center kind of need to be a leader of that group in addition to a lot of other things, but you're asking Bates to do it when this offensive line is still trying to assimilate together and kind of figure out what its identity is and which pieces really work well together. So I think that the, the post spring transfer window is portal window is going to be really interesting in terms of any moves. Oh, you could make, but I think ultimately you can't lean on that too much. You need guys in house to step up and make a big impact. And I think you have to be optimistic about what Bates said. I think he's accepting this responsibility. I think he's meeting it head on. And I think you're going to need, it sounds corny a little bit, but you kind of need guys to just embrace that mentality, accept 
that this is not ideal, that there's still a lot of things to figure out and put in the work to make it to make it work. And I think ultimately everything that you would want to hear from Bates, he said, and I think that's kind of the first step in terms of figuring out how all this is going to work. Well, you're right. It does sound corny. Embrace the mentality. You might have to make an appearance as a motivational speaker in uh, OU's film room at some point this year. But no, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that in sincerity. And it there will be a lot of healthy competition for pretty much every single spot center on out, at least on the right side of the line. I would expect Jake Sexton to be your starting left tackle and Fabechi Wiwu to be your starting left guard. The other three positions, man, it's anybody's game at this point. And Jake Taylor has had some nice moments at tackle. Uh, certainly there have been guys like Heath Ozida that have had their moments. Michael Tarquin has had his moments as well. So uh, Brent Venables and the staff have talked a lot about competitive depth through their first couple of years here. And the Sooners do have competitive depth on the offensive line, but who's going to elevate their game and seize that starting role? That's the question that remains unanswered as of now at those three spots, center, right guard, right tackle. What's your overall level of concern regarding the offensive line as we sit here today? I, like I said, I, I, I'm less concerned about the offensive line than I was coming in, or, or I'm less concerned now. And, and you know, it's not – obviously, it's not ideal that Troy ever got hurt. It's not ideal that uh, Daniel Akinkumi, uh in, got injured uh, during spring practices. You know, Garen Hatchett hasn't been a full participant. So it's – Again, there, there's still question marks, absolutely, and and some of this is going to be the like the the competition for spots, for playing time, figuring out what units work best well together. That's going to continue into the summer and fall. So I think all that being said, offensive line is still the group that I'm most concerned about. But OU's got guys, and I think OU's got guys that you're that ever that people should be confident in. And I think losing so many contributors and starters from last year has kind of cast a shadow over all this. But I think if these were guys that OU had really, or if, if these were guys that fans had seen before and were more familiar with, I think there would be less concern. I think there would be more confidence. There are playmakers and guys in that room, but the spring game I think is really going to be the biggest is going to shine the biggest light in terms of what they look like individually and what they look like together. And it hasn't helped matters that they've been banged up even outside of Everett's injury. They've had guys with bumps and bruises here and there. You want to talk about a group that has been really banged up this spring and it's not getting talked about a whole lot. And I think just because it's so deep that it hasn't really affected them, at least not conspicuously, but the Sooners have had a lot of wide receivers banged up to this point in the spring practice period. Jalil Farouk is obviously done. He's on a scooter. He'll be back in the fall, no doubt about it, but he's not going to practice for the remainder of the spring. He's got a fracture in his foot. Brennan Thompson has been banged up. Nick Anderson has been banged up. J uh, Jacquez Petaway has been banged up. Andrell Anthony is, of course, on the shelf and has been for some time as he recovers from that injury that he suffered against Texas last year. Now, one of the wide outs that has really come on strong, and no, I'm not, I'm not going to be on Burke's route here. We all know that kid's going to be good. We all know he's a stud at this point, at least I would hope. But uh, the best ability is availability, as Brent Menables has said many a time. And Jaden Gibson has not only been available, but he has been spectacular at times on the practice field. Yeah, he has, and and I'm. I'm the king of of Jaden Gibson Island. I have been since before last year. Um, and I think what he showed last year only went to show how productive he could be in limited minutes. And it just leads to curiosity of what he could do if given more playing time. But yeah, this year, I think not only has he just grown more as a player, and I think that's, you know, on the field, and I think that's earned him more time. But yeah, I think with some of the injuries, he's kind of been asked or in some ways forced to step into a bigger role and uh, also in a, in a bigger leadership role. And I think he's answered the call. And I think talking to him on Friday, that was one of the things that stood out is just how much he's embraced that. I think he just feels more confident than he did a year ago. And I think it's one of those things with as, with as deep as that wide receiver room is, there's been questions about, well, how is playing time going to be dispersed? Well, Jaden Gibson's making a strong case now, considering how available he's been, that he deserves to be at the top of the depth chart. And I think he has seized this opportunity, and now it's going to be curious to see what happens if if everybody comes back in the fall. But man, I mean, Jaden Gibson—he's six foot five. He's a matchup nightmare. He makes 
he makes catches in, in contested areas. He, he completely shut down any concerns that fans had about him going into last season. And I'm as high as I've ever been on him going into the spring game and beyond. And here's what's really exciting about Jaden Gibson is you talk to anybody in that building and they will tell you he has made strides in terms of his top end speed. And that's an exciting proposition because that means Jaden Gibson, who has already proven to be something of a field stretcher in the past, he's made a lot of big downfield catches. But if he's knocked a, a tenth of a second off his 40 time, then, man, that feels similar to me. Like C.D. Lamb, the jump that he made his sophomore year to his junior year, 2018 to 2019, he came back to Oklahoma uh, after the winter between his sophomore and junior seasons. And he was running much faster than he had ever run before. And you saw in 2019, what a much faster CD lamb was capable of and uh, had a case for the Belenikoff award. Many other years, he would have won it that year, but Jamar chase just happened to have an otherworldly season in that otherworldly LSU offense. But if that's the type of stride that Jaden Gibson has indeed made, and we won't know until we see it, but if he's made even half of that progress that CeeDee Lamb made between his sophomore and junior year, it's going to be a really exciting season for the six foot five rising junior out of Winter Garden, Florida. You know who you haven't heard a lot about this spring? And I think this is a great thing is your starting quarterback, Jackson Arnold. Uh, we actually got to talk to Jaden Gibson on Friday, and he mentions that JFA has just been doing his thing. And as the Sooners make the transition from Dylan Gabriel to Jackson Arnold, everybody is on board with the new QB1. I see a guy who's just trying to be more assertive, you know what I'm saying, trying to be more confident, trying to show the team that he can be that guy, be the leader, and that he's not scared to take chances and big risk, big reward, you know what I'm saying? Like coming from playing behind a quarterback like DG, you know what I'm saying? DG wasn't scared of anything, man. That's one thing I'll say about him, bro. He didn't he didn't care what people said about him. He didn't care nothing about that. All he wanted to do was go out there and show you that he was a great, he's going to make a big play. And I feel like that's the kind of guy that Jackson's coming into, you know what I'm saying? A guy that wants to push the ball downfield and motivate his teammates and hype the crowd up, you know what I'm saying? That's the kind of guy we need here at Oklahoma, you know? And this is a big school, it's a big stage, and all of us are blessed to be able to come here and play on this stage, and we got to take full advantage of it. And that comes with bringing energy to the team, and we're going to go as far as we go with JFA. Just keep it real. like We're going to go as far as he go. And just to expound upon what I said before I tossed that Gibson soundbite, I think it's a great thing, Jesse, when you're not hearing much of anything regarding your starting quarterback, because if the reports are, oh my goodness, he's amazing, he's dropping dimes left and right then that kind of feels like rat poison it feels like too much hype but on the other hand you also don't want to be hearing boy he does not look like he's going to be it he yeah. looks like a completely different cat than what we all expected him to be but if a guy's just handling his business exactly the way he should be handling his business on the practice field you're not going to hear his name brought up a whole heck of a lot when you have conversations with sources and that's been the case with Jackson Arnold to this point yeah it's kind of funny given that it should be just a massive storyline that everybody keeps talking about a true sophomore with one start leading OU into the SEC you feel like that would be the main question that keeps on getting spammed at everything at every availability at every practice throughout the last few weeks that just hasn't really been brought up I think and I think it is something to be optimistic about that any players that we've talked to anybody else that we've talked to is just yeah he's he's looked good we're we're getting settled in and I think there is just I think really it's just been about building chemistry between the wide receivers and and Jackson Arnold through the last few weeks and ultimately I think he just looks more confident on the field when you see him I think there is just embracing more of a, of a leadership role and I thought it was really interesting that he said when we talked to him a couple of weeks ago that as much as last year was a learning experience and he learned a lot watching Dylan Gabriel that being a backup sucks that is a direct quote from him and I think that's the thing you want to hear is just there's no nervousness there's no anything it's I'm tired of being a backup looking forward to being the starter and I think everybody else has kind of followed suit and a guy that you have heard a lot of positive buzz about is Arnold's backup or I should say one of them in true freshman Michael Hawkins but between Hawkins seventh year senior Casey Thompson by way of Texas and then Nebraska and then FAU he's on the roster there you got another true freshman in Brendan Zerbrug who brings some excitement to the table and then of course General Booty who's been a mainstay uh 
the Sooners have a ton of good depth at quarterback, and that's a refreshing spot to be in, Jesse, because it's not a luxury that the Sooners have been afforded often in recent memory. And so, look, I, I expect, and I think many expect, that Jackson Arnold is going to be the steady hand on the tiller for this Oklahoma offense in 2024. And he's surrounded with enough weapons and he has enough talent in his own right that he's going to flourish in Seth Luttrell's system. But on the off chance that he doesn't, right? It's not as if you have a situation like you did in 2022 where Dylan Gabriel goes down and then you're floundering to figure out what on earth you do without your starting quarterback. No, you have at least one if not multiple guys that you are confident enough to turn to if things go haywire. And so the depth at quarterback, and it's been noticeable to me on the practice field, just watching the way those guys have thrown the ball around is, oh, okay. Like it's, it's not just Jackson Arnold. Yeah, this is Jackson Arnold's team, but the future of the quarterback position at Oklahoma is quite a bright one. It was really it was really interesting on Friday to see in the open portion we got to see when they went to that two-minute drill style uh, session that it was Jackson Arnold leading the first-team offense, and then it's Michael Hawkins out there with the second-team offense. And the defense played really, really well in that stretch, but you saw what the potential is there for, for Michael Hawkins, his speed, his ability to scramble and make things out of nothing. That's that's what he has. And I think as, as much as Jackson Arnold really looks the part of a starting quarterback in a lot of ways, just his size and, and his ability to throw down the field, I think there's real excitement about Michael Hawkins and he's unique in what he brings to that quarterback room as a whole. And I think he has been one of the more impressive, not only just new guys, but, but guys as a whole in the spring. And yeah, I think he's in some ways kind of taking the lead for that backup quarterback spot. And I think there's absolutely excitement for what he can bring because, I mean, he's not just a runner either. He can throw down the field, but I think his running ability, his ability to make plays and improvise really make him stand apart in that quarterback room. Well, it'll be a fun weekend as Sooner fans get the opportunity to see what their new QB1 looks like. Of course, what Hawkins looks like in his first uh, game speed action, public game speed action, I suppose, as a member of the Oklahoma roster. And you get to see the likes of David Stone, Jaden Jackson. You get to see Dion Burks in person. Obviously, if you're a Sooner fan, there's no reason not to be at Gaylord Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium this weekend as the Sooners will conduct their annual spring game April 20th at 2 p.m. So whether you show up there and see us there or whether we simply see you again via the magic of technology on this YouTube channel, we thank you for being a member of the OU Insider family in whatever capacity uh, you are a member. Now, OUinsider.com is, of course, the place to be if you want all the insider juice on your team and – your coaching staff's recruiting efforts, both on the football side and on the basketball side. So would highly encourage you to go sign up for a VIP membership over there. It'll only cost you a little bit north of $8 a month. And trust me, Jesse and I and the rest of the crew will make it worth your while. Until we see you again, this has been Quick Slants on the OU Insider YouTube channel. Take care, everybody.